Today I really wanted to, in our time together, share with you some OWASP tools that I find uh, interesting and, uh, and extremely useful. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. Now we've got this slide here on cross-site scripting. I'm going to assume everybody here already knows about what XSS is, right? How many people, quick show of hands, have fixed XSS in their apps before? Nice, that's a very high percentage, and we, it's no, no, uh, no, no surprise that he, given the track that we're in. Usually when I go to developer conferences and ask that same question, it's 20, 30% of the room that raises their hand versus the 80% that just raised their hand here. Now, I don't really want to go into all of the details about XXX. What I'd really like to talk about is tennis. Are there any tennis fans here in the room? Quick show of hands. Oh, that's pretty good. Maybe 5% of the room are tennis fans. Any Maria Sharapova fans? Yeah, a few, uh, okay, a few more, right? Really popular tennis player, one and a quarter million followers on Twitter. Did you know that some time ago, she kind of went through a little career crisis? She didn't want to be in tennis anymore, and so she announced on her website that she was going to be leaving the world of tennis to become a CCIE, a Cisco Certified Internetworking Expert. It's pretty hot, right? And this was real. It had to be real because it was on the exact same day. It was jointly announced on her website, mariasharapova.com, and on cisco.com, the exact same time. Did anybody hear about this? <laughs> it, true story. True story. This actually happened. Now, of course, it was a ruse. It was fake, right? It was jointly announced on April Fool's Day, right? And some Russian hackers had found some cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in both mariasharapova.com and cisco.com, saved them up until April Fool's Day, published links with a bunch of extra JavaScript code in the parameters on the internet. People would click them. Once they clicked the link, right, that evil JavaScript code rewrote the contents of the page, access to the DOM, and issued fake press releases on both of those sites. So that was your classic case of reflected cross-site scripting that I'm sure that you guys are all already familiar with. Now, cross-site scripting, as we just described, occurs when bad data, unvalidated data, evil data is sent back down and rendered in the browser itself. So how do you prevent this from occurring? Of course, you could do input validation. That's not the ideal way to prevent XSS from occurring. You really want to do the appropriate output encoding when the data goes back out, back to the browser. There's an awesome reference article on the OWASP website called the XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet. Who's heard of the XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet? Good, excellent. And we get now to the first two OWASP tools that I want to mention to you. Number one is the OWASP Enterprise Security API, eSAPI. Who has used eSAPI in their applications before? Oh, not, not so many. Okay, about maybe 10, 15% or so. OWASP eSAPI, Enterprise Security API, as the name implies, is a very comprehensive security API. If you look at the Javadoc, online Javadoc for it, you can see that there's functionality classes for almost any type of security activity, security thing that you might want to do in your application itself. The little snippet we have here is really specifically focused on the encoder class and how we do the appropriate output encoding as the data goes back out to the browser so we can prevent XSS from occurring. The second tool that I want to mention, though, at the bottom is the OWASP Java encoder. Now, unlike eSAPI, the Enterprise Security API, the Java encoder is really focused, as the name implies, only on one thing, providing the appropriate output encoding functionality to prevent XSS. So if you want a more comprehensive right, API, I would suggest using eSAPI, right? a lot of other security features in there. If you want something more focused, you don't want to import a bunch of other stuff into your class path, I would recommend using the Java encoders. It's uh, a lot of focus on performance there in terms of the Java encoder as well. Now, the problem with these, uh, these APIs and any other API that you might find from another organization is that, well, we as security experts and developers, we've got to go into the appropriate parts of our application right, and figure out, well, what data is being sent back out to the browser and apply, call these appropriate methods at the appropriate time to fix, right, to output escape, output encode the data going back out, right? Kind of a pain. It's a lot of work to do that, and that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why XSS is still so persistent. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some way that we could handle this in a not one-off line-by-line code basis in terms of interrogating our application? Well, one of the things that attackers like to do with cross-site scripting is steal your session IDs. Because if they steal your session ID, right, using document.cookie, sending it to some other website that they control, parsing it out of their web logs, they can conduct a session hijacking attack. 
stealing your active session ID and getting access to the application as you. So what we could do is turn on the HTTP only flag for our cookies, our sensitive cookies like our session ID, like our J session ID in Java, thereby helping to mitigate session hijacking attacks because the HTTP only flag prevents client side scripts, JavaScript from accessing the contents of your cookie. And this is one way that we can mitigate XSS in a more kind of comprehensive approach. You can kind of ignore perhaps all of the stuff here on the slides. These are just some examples of how you configure your Java application to turn on HTTP only for your session ID, your J session ID, and how you could do it programmatically down here at the bottom as well for, for whatever cookie, whatever sensitive cookie you might be using in your application. Make sense? Now, wouldn't it be really nice is if there was something else that allowed us to prevent XSS, right, mitigate XSS on a more comprehensive scale, not just mitigating one specific type of XSS attack. Right? Well, fortunately there is, and this is about as modern, in my opinion, as you can get in terms of application defense, using content security policy. Now, let me ask you guys, who, this might be a dumb question, who has heard of content security policy? Good, maybe, maybe about half of the folks. So who, out of you guys that have heard of it, who has used it to defend their applications? Very small percentage, I only see three hands up in the room. Content security policy helps us prevent XSS by allowing you, by allowing us to define a whitelist of acceptable locations from which our JavaScript and other resources can actually come from. And by defining that trusted whitelist of sources, it allows us to mitigate the risk of XSS from actually occurring. Now, how does it work? We've got some header names down at the bottom. The, the one in the, the finalized spec is the first one, content-security-policy. You set that HTTP response header, send it back down to the browser, and the browser will see that and say, oh, I need to protect this page against XSS using CSP. Now, if you want to use content security policy, I got to tell you up front, there's a couple of restrictions, right? There's a little, some things that you have to do in your app, so you have to watch out for it. You can't have any inline scripts, so you can't have any script tags now in your, directly in your HTML code, right? Those won't work anymore. You also can't do any inline event handlers like we see here with the onClick attribute. And correspondingly, you can't have any inline styles as well. Now for newer applications that you develop, maybe that's not such a big deal because you can factor that in ahead of time. But for legacy applications, right, there could be script tags all over the place. So you gotta plan ahead a little bit if you wanna use content security policy and your apps do have inline scripts. So you gotta watch out for that. Anybody gone through this exercise before? No, so you gotta be, you gotta be careful for that. Now there's various directives that CSP actually supports that can define what, what, what whitelist trusted locations we want stuff to come from. So you can see that we've got JavaScript, we've got where our styles should come from, our images, our frames, fonts, and so on. And let's go ahead, instead of walking through that boring list of different supported attributes, let's look at a couple different examples. Number one up here at the top, right, is we can only load resources from the same origin is the strictest thing that you could do. You can define that content security policy, HTTP response header, right? Going back down to the browser, saying the default source is self, meaning I only trust stuff to come from my origin, right? My, uh, my protocol, my port, and my domain combination. Now we've got an example here in number two from MikeWest.org. Anybody know Mike? He's a developer on the Chrome team based out of Germany, works over at Google. And on his personal website, MikeWest.org, this is the content security policy that he has used. And you can see here, he's got the default, source is none at the top, styles being loaded from his content delivery network, only allowing framing from YouTube and SlideShare. Scripts, JavaScript can only come from either his content delivery network here or from Google Analytics same thing with images coming from his content delivery network or Google Analytics or any data URLs that he might have embedded. And finally, fonts can only come from his CDN as well. And so you can see here, by defining these trusted locations, we are minimizing, mitigating the potential risk of cross-site scripting attacks in our applications. Does this make sense? All right, now I mentioned that it's a little bit 
problematic. If you've got a legacy application, you need to take out the script tags, you need to make sure everything still works, can't have inline JavaScript. You don't necessarily want to go ahead tomorrow and turn on content security policy without the appropriate testing. And to do that in production, what you could do is you can use this report only, content security policy dash report only header. And this tells the browser not to block any XSS or any script that you might find in your application, but it says, hey, if we find anything, if the browser de detects anything when we pass this header down, let's go ahead and just send a JSON formatted message back to the report URI that you see down here at the bottom. And this is an example, a real example from Facebook. This is the content security policy that Facebook was using for a little bit, for a little while, to actually do the report only, gather some real intelligence, real usage patterns, real events from the production application so that they can, in the future, fine tune, right? Fine tune their content security policy and go back and fix any, remove any inline scripts or other issues that they might have had. So that is the report only functionality for content security policy. All right, so that brings us to a very basic demo. I'm going to be honest with you, it's a very basic demo that we're going to show here. And I'm going to switch over to a, a VM that we've got running. And here in the VM, in the browser, these are just some, uh, uh, in this beautiful page are some links that I'm going to be using throughout the course of this, uh, this session here. And the first one is uh, a little basic, basic XSS demo. Make this a little bit bigger for you guys. This is probably going to be uh, a little bit hard to see in the back. But all it's doing in the URL is, let's make this a little bit bigger. You can see that it's going to a, a purposely vulnerable page, xss.jsp, taking a couple URL parameters, the message parameter and the name parameter, and I switch this to um, OWASP, and all it does is change it to hello OWASP. And in your classic, you guys already know all of this, but in classic form, we can just, as one of the parameters, switch it to a script tag, and I'll make this a little bit bigger for you guys so you guys can see it in the back. Instead of saying OWASP or a name here, we just sw switch it to some simple JavaScript, and now, when we hit enter, Right? The JavaScript actually gets sent up to the server, right? just like in the Maria Sharapova example, gets sent back down to the browser, echoed back in the output stream, and the browser sees this and says, oh, well, it's told me to execute some script, in this case, the alert function to pop up an alert box, so that's exactly what the browser does, resulting in your classic case of reflected cross-site scripting. But what we want to see instead here, switching back to the bookmarks page, is an actual protection. So here, all we've done all I've done is in the basic JSP code here, included the content security policy header. And we'll look at that in a second. But here, if we try to recreate the attack and say script alert XSS, closing script tag in the URL bar here, just like we did before, and then we hit enter, nothing happens. Right? So we've prevented XSS from occurring by implementing content security policy for this page, and we can verify that here by looking at the traffic. I'm going to go over to this, uh, this other tool here, Zap, Z Attack Proxy, another OWASP tool that I find very useful. How many people have used Zap before? Oh yeah, really, really popular. Yeah, everybody's used Zap. So you can see here, down at the bottom, for those of you that haven't used it, are all of the requests that the browser has sent up to the server. Over here on the left-hand side is a little hierarchy of all of the websites that we've visited since we've turned on Zap and have started browsing. And once I go ahead and click on one of these, uh, let's go ahead and click on this one, I think is the right one. You can see that the response tab, the response coming back down from the server, actually uh, populates here so we can look at some of the details. And right here, you can see, if I zoom in a little bit, in the, that JSP code, all we had to do was set the content security policy header. In this case, I just made it the most strict that we could do it, saying the default source is self, only allowing stuff from my same origin, only allowing JavaScript and other things from my same origin, right? not to be come in from the URL parameter that we saw, and it prevented the execution of that JavaScript, thereby protecting our app against XSS. Pretty awesome, right? Yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. All right, so that is content security policy and Z attack proxy. And we have a question here.
Good question. Do I have an example of what the report mode data looks like? I do not have it handy on this machine, which is a brand new machine with nothing else on it. Uh, but it is just JSON formatted. It will tell you what, uh, what URL created the trigger, and it will say what CSP directive it violated. So it will, it will say something like, and I forget the exact terminology here, but it will say something like inline dash script was the thing that triggered it. So you'll know exactly what it was and where it was in your application. I do have that on my other machine, but I don't have that right here. Yes, it does have that. Yeah, it does have the enough details to figure it out. Yeah, and uh, yep. Cool. Any other questions, comments? All right, so switching back to the slides here. Right now, this is uh, using modern defense and HTTP header to protect against cross-site scripting. Wouldn't it also be nice if there were some other headers that helped us not just have to one-off manually fix things in our applications, but protect them kind of more generically like we see with this header example here? Fortunately, there is. There's something called strict transport security. Who is familiar with this one? All right, well, maybe about a third of the folks. Now, you guys know, we, we know, all know that encryption is extremely important. Right now, you know, I've been saying this for probably a decade, is I think everything should be default encrypted, SSL, and so on. And there's a problem with that, though. You know, if you turn on SSL for your application and somebody goes to HTTP slash slash mycompany.com, what happens is that that plain text request gets sent up to the server, right? And the server will redirect you to the SSL version. So there's a slight window of opportunity there for an attacker to inject himself, himself or herself, into the unencrypted stream and right, do bad stuff. Right? We've got stuff like Moxie Marlin Spike's SSL strip tool that uh, will help automate some of those attacks. So tr strict transport security is, uh, is a header, is a protection that is helping to mitigate and close that little window of opportunity. If you have a browser, if you're using a browser that supports strict transport security, and you define this header, pass it back down to the browser for your site, it will go ahead and cache the certificate on the browser itself for a predetermined amount of time, as you see in the lower right-hand corner. And then, next time you visit your application, even if you type HTTP mycompany.com, it will still do the communication over SSL. Okay. Pretty cool. Closing the window of opportunity for an attacker to sniff your communications. Another header that's very important to consider is X-Frame Options, and X-Frame Options is used to prevent clickjacking. Clickjacking discovered some years ago by Jeremiah Grossman and Robert R. Snake Hansen. Clickjacking is an attack that tricks you, the victim, into clicking on something. Hey, click here to win a free prize. But when you click on it, under the covers, right, or actually technically in the foreground, in a foreground invisible image, you're clicking on something else. And when this was first discovered by uh, Jeremiah, disclosed by Jeremiah and, and Robert, they showed that at the time there was this issue in Adobe Acrobat that clicking on a certain thing in Adobe would give the attacker access to enable the victim's microphone and camera to conduct remote spying. And so there's a number of different things that attackers can do with clickjacking. There's if you have clickjacking on Facebook, they call it like jacking because they're tricking you into clicking the like button to increase the likes on a site, to increase the amount of traffic that goes to it, right? to increase ad revenue, or force you to go to a site that will uh, get more people to go to a site to sign up for some subscription services. Point being, you want to prevent clickjacking from occurring. The way that you prevent clickjacking is by passing down the X-Frame Options header back down to the browser. The X-Frame Options header has three different options. Deny, meaning, hey, nothing can be framed. Nothing in your website, in your particular page can be framed. Same origin as the name implies, only allowing stuff from your same origin, again, your port protocol and domain, from framing your particular page. And then we've got a, a third option down below that, as of recently, is only currently supported by IE. But the point being that if you pass down X-Frame options, it will prevent clickjacking from occurring in your applications. All right, so using secure headers. We've talked about a number of different headers, content security policy, strict transport security, X-Frame options, HTTP only is in addition to the set-cookie header. Right? There's also, this brings us to the next OWASP project that I want to mention, share with you guys, is the OWASP secure headers project. Projects for supporting different languages, .NET, uh, Java, as well as Ruby. 
It's got some code in there that will let you automatically apply these headers to various parts of your application. There's also something called the Security Header Injection mod mod Module, excuse me, developed by Eric Johnson, who I see sitting here in the middle of the room, and Aaron Kier. They're going to be giving a talk today at 3 o'clock, talking about Shim, right, and how they have plans to actually contribute that back to the OWASP Secure Headers project. So this is going to be a very handy tool. Shim is going to be written in .NET. There's already a Java and Ruby version, as I mentioned, to automatically apply these headers that we talked about to different parts of your application. All right, any questions, comments so far? Yes? Any chance that uh, these will be ported over to Python and other languages? I have not heard if it will go to Python specifically. Anybody in the room know that, uh, know that answer in terms of the secure headers module? The uh, sounds like a perfect opportunity to contribute to the secure headers project, but yes, Eric? Excellent, yes. At Black Hat two years ago, there was a proposed header for CSRF mitigation. I think it was being driven by all the people. Uh -huh. The comment, just so everybody can hear, is that a couple years ago at Black Hat, there was some talk about having a header that would be used for, proposed header, to be used for CSRF protection. CSRF is actually what we're going to talk about in the very next section here. I actually have not heard that other than to, s to hear that I think the CSP 2.0, Content Security Policy 2.0 um, specification, is looking to add a lot more protections. And I believe from my initial scan through one of the early versions, CSRF was mentioned in there. But yeah, don't, don't exactly quote me on that. I got to go back and read the, the later versions of that draft specification. All right, anybody else before we move on? So that brings us to perfect segue here. Thank you very much. Content, uh, excuse me, cross-site request forgery, CSRF. <coughs> now I'm sure many of you, <coughs> excuse me, are already familiar with CSRF. CSRF allows an attacker to force you, the victim, to send a forged request under the covers to an application, right? Thereby executing some functionality without your knowledge, right? Without your knowledge, and executing that functionality usually has some nice side effect, nice benefit for the attacker himself. Now that's a little bit verbose. So let's walk through the real quick. The classic example. Let's say in the upper right-hand corner in step number one, you're doing some online banking. You're going to mybank.com, paying some bills, transferring some funds, buying some stocks, selling some stocks, whatever it may be. You go to mybank.com, you do all of your stuff. You, you decide that you're done, right? So then you say, oh, I'm going to go to a different site, but you don't sign off of mybank.com. Just because a lot of people, they don't sign off of sites when they're done with them, right? They leave that browser window open, go to a different site. In this case, you decide that you want to go in step number two on the left to attacker.com. Now, it's not really going to be called attacker.com. I just put that up there to make it explicit. That's going to be some attacker controlled or attacker compromised. Like, uh, like mariasharapova.com or something like that. So you unwittingly go to mariasharapova.com and unbeknownst to you, the site is controlled by an attacker. And in step number three, they've already pre included some evil CSRF code on that website. And in step number three, that evil CSRF code, this might be a little bit hard to see, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, is some basic HTML code. And you can see in this example, this HTML form, all it does is it posts, right, the action posts to transfer.jsp saying that I should transfer $1,000 from your account to my attacker controlled account. So. Once you visit the site, this evil HTML right, comes to your browser in the middle, right? your, your computer in the middle here. Your browser sees that and it says, oh, well, this form is auto-posting. Let me go ahead and do what the HTML is telling me to do. The browser will automatically send the request in step number four up to mybank.com. Right? And your browser also sends your session cookie. Mybank.com sees that you're still signed on and it goes ahead and processes this request to transfer thousand bucks from you to me. All right, so that was a quick recap of cross-site request forgery. Transferring money, right? getting you to, to execute a forged request under the covers. All right, yes, comment, question. Does this vulnerability exist if, if you are in separate caps? Like if 
the, does, the question is, does this vulnerability exist if you are in separate tabs? Um, let me go back to some ancient history real quick here. So related to that question, IE6, right? And unfortunately, lots of companies especially still use IE6. IE6, it used to be, and I, I might be remembering this in the reverse order, but if you did opened up an IE6 window and you did control N, right? It would create it in the same IE session. So those would be shared. So they, they, in either window, it would still potentially work. If you'd opened it up with the uh, IE6 icon, you would create a separate instance of IE. So this wouldn't work between those two different instances. Now, circling back to your question about tabs, that's one thing that I haven't tested. I know different browsers behave differently. If you've got privacy mode on or privacy mode off, each tab is sandboxed and so on. So in some cases, it still may work in a separate tab. In other cases, with privacy mode, I, again, I haven't tested this, so I can't say definitively. I don't think it'll work in certain cases, especially with privacy mode on, but we need to test that. Good question. Anything else? All right, so, yes? In the question is, in going back to content security policy, away from this, does, can content security policy detect base64 encoded text in your HTML and see if there's an attack in there? Uh, no, it doesn't, do, it doesn't do that. It's not that, it's not that uh, sophisticated. All right, so cross-site request forgery here. Now, this then brings us to the next OWASP project that I want to talk about. It's called OWASP OneLiner. And OWASP OneLiner isn't a tool that you necessarily use to uh, defend your application. This is a deliberately vulnerable application intended for demos and training, written by John Willander, based out of Sweden. And uh, this is a very cool application, in my opinion. It's kind of Twitter-like in a sense. It's got a UI where you can have, it's, got, it's a messaging app, where you can have a number of different uh, people on your friends list, your followers, if you will, and you can send messages back and forth to each other like you do with Twitter. And so based on the vul that vulnerable application, let's go ahead and take a look at a quick demo. Right, JSON, in this particular case, using CSRF to exploit uh, JSON formatted messages that the browser might be sending in our Web 2.0 applications back up to the server. So if I switch again back to the VM, going back to Firefox here, again, my uh, homepage, the first line I'm going to go ahead and click, uh, the link I'm going to click is the uh, the link to OneLiner. Go ahead and confirm my SSL warning because I've just got self-signed SSL certificates in my test environment here. And oh, this is uh, pretty small for you guys. I'm going to go ahead and make this bigger. All right, so you can see we've already got some, some messages and we've got our list of friends, our followers over here on the right-hand side. And we can all send different messages to each other. So in the upper right-hand corner, right, in our OneLiner application, you can see I'm logged in as John already. And I'm just going to go ahead and say, hello, OWASP and say something like, I love Java, right? Of course, who, who doesn't love Java, right? And so these are the different messages that I'm going to go ahead and send to all of my friends. But what we can go ahead and do, and under the covers, right, this application is sending, creating JSON formatted messages, sending it up to the server so that it could be pushed back out to the app so that other people can see these messages. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a separate browser window here and put them side by side. And I will make this a little bit bigger for you guys in a, in a moment. If I can go ahead and find the right thing here. All right, and the, the, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to simulate going to attacker.com. Simulate going to our hacked mariasharapova.com. And to do that, I'm just going to go ahead and click this link right here. So you might be surfing the web, you might be on Reddit and say, hey guys, go ahead and click this link to see this amusing image of dancing pigs. So we go ahead and click this link, but I want you to keep your eyes on the left-hand side after this pig stops dancing. And you can see that a message on the left-hand side automatically appeared. And this message says, hey, I actually hate Java, right? And you guys probably know me. I would never say something like that. And under the covers, what happened is you saw these dancing pigs, but as we saw on the slide, there was an HTML form that auto-submitted that sent a request back up to the one-liner application that we saw in the background browser here and forced you, the victim, forced me, the victim, to send another message to all of my followers using cross-site request forgery. All right, so if I go back to the slides here, how did this actually work? 
Well, under the covers, the one-liner application is using this exact formatted JSON message. And this JSON message in particular, right, the, the valid one would say something like, I love Java, but the evil one actually looks like this with that message that says, I hate Java, and there's something peculiar at the end of it. It's got the slash slash equals dummy, right? And that slash slash, as we know from, uh, from code, that's, that's a comment, right? So it comments out everything else that comes after it. Now, how was this actually crafted in terms of the HTML that was included on that Dancing Pigs page that we saw? And this is where it was, uh, John did something a little bit clever. This is just to point out that he set the encoding type text.plane, the style visibility equals hidden, because we didn't see the HTML form in the Dancing Pigs page. We've got the evil message here, I hate Java, but you can see that the JSON here is included in the name attribute of this form. It's usually not where you include some data, that's usually just where you have the name of the form field itself. So the JSON is included in the name, and the value is dummy here, right? And at the very end of the name value, you can see, I don't know if you can see the red highlighting there in the back, but that's where the slash slash is, because when the browser automatically concatenates these name and value fields, right, name equals value and sends it back up, right, it's commenting out everything else after the actual value field itself. And this is how, in the one-liner application, right, we've got the JSON, JavaScript object notation, CSRF attack actually crafted. Pretty cool, right? And, and this, of course, results in the forged JSON message that we saw earlier. So, how do we prevent this from actually occurring? This is where we get to our, uh, our last OWASP tool that we're going to be talking about today, is CSRF Guard. Who has used, or who is familiar with CSRF Guard? Okay, not too many people. Maybe I only saw a handful of hands go up there. Now, real quick, before we talk about CSRF Guard specifically, how do we protect against CSRF? Right, we've got these forge requests potentially going back and forth under the covers. Very beautiful, very beautiful summary. For those of you that didn't hear, hidden one-time use token in your page. Right? You have to include something in the request that the attacker doesn't know. By including something in, in the request the attacker doesn't know, he doesn't know what that hidden one-time value is, and he can't include it in attacker.com for the attack to be successful. So that's exactly what CSRF Guard, written by Eric Sheridan, does. It allows you to inject this anti-CSRF token, this hidden one-time token, into your applications, into your pages, using two different approaches. The first approach, you can do it manually. There's a JSP tag that you can use, different JSP tags that you can use. Second approach is using some automatic DOM manipulation. Let's go ahead and look at these things one at a time. So in terms of the manual, JSP tags that you can directly put into your HTML. Right, there's some, uh, some example forms here. There's an example form here in the lower right hand corner, in the middle here, excuse me. Right, these are some examples of the CSRF Guard tags allowing you to pull down a token name that's generated by CSRF Guard as well as a token value, that, that one time field generated by the, uh, the API. If you want a convenience method, a convenience tag, you can also use the CSRF token tag as well as the form and anchor tags down here at the bottom that will automatically generate forms and links for you with the CSRF token embedded in it. So once the user clicks that form, that hidden form field with this long random value is going to get sent back up to the server. CSRF guard on the server side is implemented as a filter. The filter captures it, will compare that value of that filter to what it generated, stored on the server side, and then if they don't match, well, it's going to stop the request from being processed preventing the thousand bucks from being transferred from you to me. Right? The second approach, and this is really cool, is the automatic protection, automatic DOM manipulation. Now, to use this, all you have to do is include the JavaScript that we see at the top, the JavaScript servlet, into any page that you want to be protected by this automatic protection. And under the covers, if you look at the JavaScript from that JavaScript servlet, it's a, it's a clever approach here. The JavaScript right, is used there's some new JavaScript in there that specifically hooks the open and send methods that's used by the XML HTTP request, the XHR object that's at the heart of Ajax, right, to create these dynamic applications. And it overloads those two different methods. The first one, here you can see in the middle, is it overloads the over open method to store the specific URL. And then the send method is overloaded to 
uh, modify the, uh, the onSend method, the send method itself, to add this call to onSend. And if we look at the call to onSend here on the next slide, you can see that this is where the token value is being automatically included by the JavaScript on the page, specifically adding the X requested with header and the CSRF token um, header in the request. And so this is what's automatically sending it back up to the server for our automatic protection. Anybody use this, this approach with CSRF card? Those of you that raised their hands? All right, very cool, one person. All right, so that brings us to the demo then. So switching back to the VM, what we want to do is go back to OneLiner. This is a slightly different version. <clears throat> Once we get to OneLiner here, you can see in the upper right-hand corner, we are no longer logged in as John. We're log logged in as the June user. And let's go ahead and send a message to show that it actually works. But now what I want to do is he over here, back in the attacker uh, site, I'm going to simulate you going to the attacker controlled site by clicking, again, the Dancing Pigs link down here at the very bottom. Once we go ahead and click that, once it's done, you can see that, hey, now, CSRF guard, because we properly configured it as we said on the slides, it thwarted this potential CSRF attack because the Dancing Pig site didn't have the right CSRF token in it. And in the background, we can see that the attack message actually didn't get sent. So if we go ahead and take a look at what actually happened over here in Z attack proxy, scrolling down, if I can go ahead and find the right one, All right, you can see, I think. Uh, right here. Well, point being, there's so many that happen because under the covers, the application keeps on refreshing, so there's a lot of different requests that get sent. But the point being is, when you go to the Dancing Pig site, and it tries to send that CSRF request using that form that we saw, it's gonna go ahead, instead, CSRF card detects this, and it's gonna go ahead and say, hey, that's not valid. I'm going to, instead of processing the request normally, I'm going to redirect you to the CSRF error page right here. And that's the page that we saw on the site. Yes? Uh, so two questions. How does CSRF card report when there's an exception? Like how do you use that trap and do different actions other than maybe a uh, redirect on? And also, could you show the value of the application that that CSRF card enables? Uh, there was like three or four different questions in there. So, <laughs> so, uh, so the question is, how can, one question was, how configurable is CSRF guard and how can you tell it to do different things? It's extremely configurable. There are two different configuration files that come with CSRF guard that let you kind of configure the installation itself. And then another file or another part of the file that lets you configure um, the different ways that it should behave. So should you generate one token per session? Should you generate one token per page? Um, what is the characteristics of the token value itself? What should you do? Where should you redirect to? And all of those things. So yeah, very, very configurable. Um, the second bigger question I think I heard was, um, you wanted me to show, what was it? Oh, yes, okay. So the question is, can we show some details of what gets included in the request itself? And yes, let me go ahead and try to find it here. And as I mentioned, you know, as uh, the one-liner application is open in the browser, it keeps polling the server for different things and sending different messages to the server, which is why we see so many different requests here. So it's going to take me just one moment to find that. And, and actually, we, you know, I might, it might be better, actually, because it might take me a while to find it. It is here, uh, but maybe I can show that uh, offline. Let me go ahead. Ah, good point, good point. Um, let me get to that in one second here. Let's go ahead and finish up this first one. Go ahead and send another request. You can see this one down here, I believe, at the bottom is what we sent. Ah, show it here in there. Ah.